Do you understand what it means to be created in the image of God? I'm convinced that somewhere around 90% of the world's problems would be solved if people would get their minds around this one idea. And yet, even the people who believe that we're created in the image of God rarely have any clue what that means. If you'd like to finally get it, you're about to get some help from an unlikely source, a cancer-riddled comic genius. Watch this till the end, and you will see the world a bit differently. Back in September, comedian Norm MacDonald lost his battle with cancer. Oh wait, I forgot, I'm not supposed to say that. See, in the old days, a man could just get sick and die, you know? Now, they have to wage a battle. And the reason I don't like it is because in the old days, they go, hey, that old man died. Now, they go, hey, he, he lost his battle. <laughs> That's no way to end your life, you know? What a loser that guy was. <laughs> Last thing he did was lose. So what should we say? when someone dies of cancer. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, if you die, the cancer also dies at exactly the same time. So that, to me, is not a loss, that's a draw. That's a, you know what I mean? Comedian Norm MacDonald waged an epic nine-year battle with cancer and fought cancer to a draw. That does sound better. But I'll tell you, the more I hear about cancer, the more I don't care for it. I've been watching Norm MacDonald for years, and when he died, I ended up watching a bunch of clips of him on YouTube. Of course, when you start watching videos on a certain topic on YouTube, what does YouTube do? It recommends a bunch of other videos on the same topic. So for weeks, YouTube was giving me more and more Norm MacDonald videos to watch. Eventually, I watched some videos, usually audio only from podcasts, where Norm talked seriously about God, Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, Judaism, the soul, things like that. And it's interesting to hear him talk seriously, because usually, if the topic of religion would come up during an interview, he'd go into comedian mode. When he was being serious, sometimes he would say that he's a Christian, other times it sounded like he was closer to Judaism, still other times he would claim to be some sort of generic theist, Part of the reason for the shifting positions was his methodology. Norm was a fan of intuition. Certain things seemed true to him based on a feeling, an instinct, a hunch, some sense of the way the world is that wasn't based on reasoning. Then he would reason based on his intuitions, and he would lean towards whatever position fit his intuitions best. Let's go through an example of his reasoning process. Norm said he always had an intuition that a personal God exists. I just have an intuition that there's a, that there's a, a God. When I say God, I don't mean like a, a force or something. I mean a, an actual uh, personage. I just have this intuition that there is one. Like, I've always had it. But he wasn't impressed with the information you might find in gospel tracts. Everything I've read from, um, from religious tracts or stuff all seem like insane to me. So I haven't really found one. But, um, but although I do, I, I will say this, of all the religions, I like uh, Judaism and I like Christianity. Now that's strange. When someone gave him a pitch for Judaism or Christianity in a religious tract, it sounded insane to him. And yet, he said he liked Judaism and Christianity. What was going on here? Well, Norm had an intuition about man, and Judaism and Christianity fit his intuition better than other ideologies did. His intuition was that human beings are a kind of paradox, and that somehow we're simultaneously something spectacular and divine and something horrible and depraved. But it's easy to emphasize either the spectacular and divine aspect or the horrible and depraved aspect. There are some people that believe that like 
man is divine, like like kind of a hippie idea that we are all like beautiful creatures. So, anyways, I can't believe that because I know my own heart, and I know that's not true. Why are there people who think of human beings as divine, sometimes even as gods and goddesses, temporarily trapped in human bodies? Well, there's obviously a radical difference between human beings and other animals. We have a constantly expanding control over nature. We have an aesthetic sense that gives rise to art and music. We use moral concepts to judge our actions. We use logic and evidence to evaluate arguments. We understand mathematics and philosophy and history and science. We explore the world. We explore the universe. We explore the cells in our body. We're drawn to something spiritual. We're so obviously different from anything else in nature that we seem divine by comparison. You're breathtaking. You're all breathtaking. There's only one problem. Most of us know ourselves well enough to know that we really, really suck. So enough of all this unleash your inner goddess nonsense. We're terrible. And this leads to a completely different understanding of human nature. And then, like other people believe, like we're wretched, like like the, the cynics, you know, or the atheists or whatever it would be would would believe that we're all just wretched, like nothingness, you know, we're just animals, just creatures. So I can't believe that. That doesn't make any sense, you know, that we're just beasts. Why are there people who think of human beings as mere animals, mere beasts? Apart from obvious biological similarities, the simple fact is that human beings often act like beasts. Even when we use the abilities that set us apart from other animals, we end up using them to satisfy the same drives that we share with mere animals. In other words, we use our capacity for creativity and innovation to produce the internet the greatest information sharing revolution in history. And then we use the internet to watch porn. But it gets worse because the abilities that set us apart from other animals allow us to behave far, far worse than the animals. Since Norm MacDonald was a huge fan of Russian authors, here's a passage from Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov that Norm was quite familiar with. By the way, in Moscow, not long ago, a Bulgarian told me, Ivan went on, ignoring Alyosha's remark, of the atrocities committed all over his country by Turks and Circassians, who, fearing a general uprising of the Slav population, set villages of fire, rape women and children, nail their prisoners to fences by the ears, and leave them in that state until morning, when they hang them, and who commit other atrocities that are difficult even to imagine. People often describe such human cruelty as bestial. But that's, of course, unfair to animals. For no beast could ever be as cruel as man. I mean, as refinedly and artistically cruel. The tiger simply gnaws and tears his victim to pieces because that's all he knows. It would never occur to a tiger to nail people to fences by their ears, even if he were able to do it. Those Turks, by the way, seem to derive a voluptuous pleasure from torturing children. They do everything from cutting unborn babies out of their mother's wombs with their daggers to tossing infants into the air and catching them on the points of their bayonets as the mothers watch. It's doing this in front of the mothers that particularly arouses their senses. But of the things the Bulgarian told me, the following scene particularly caught my attention. Imagine a baby in the arms of his trembling mother, with Turks all around them. The Turks are having a little game. They laugh and tickle the baby to make it laugh, too. Finally, they succeed, and the baby begins to laugh. Then one of the Turks points his pistol at the baby, holding it four inches from the child's face. The little boy chuckles delightedly and tries to catch the shiny pistol in his tiny hands. Suddenly, the artist presses the trigger, and fires it into the baby's face, splitting his little head in half. Pure art, isn't it? Incidentally, I understand that Turks are very fond of sweet things. Why are you telling me all this, Ivan? Alyosha asked. I think that if the devil doesn't exist, 
and is therefore man's creation, man has made him in his own image. Just as he has created God in that case. Yes, I just quoted a passage from one of Norm MacDonald's favorite authors, which talks about Satan being created in man's image to help make a point in a video about man being created in the image of God. That just happened. So, in one sense, man seems amazing and divine when we compare him with the rest of the natural world. And in another sense, man seems depraved and demonic when we compare him with the rest of the natural world. Man isn't one or the other, he's both simultaneously. The correct doctrine of man, then, needs to account for both facts about man. <clears throat> so I will say that the Christianity has this interesting uh, compromise where we're both divine and wretched. The other two are are both seem equally untrue. One that we're all divine and interconnected with nature just seems like nonsense to me. The other that we're beasts of the field seems like nonsense to me. So I, I kind of like that, that Christian uh, idea. We're both divine and wretched. Here Norm is referring to the doctrine in both Judaism and Christianity that human beings, both men and women, have been created in the image of God, but that human beings have been corrupted by sin. Let's have a quick crash course on this topic, and we'll see what Norm is getting at. According to Genesis 1, 26 to 28, Genesis 5, 1 to 3, Genesis 9, 6, and James 3, 9, human beings, both male and female, were created in the image of God. But what does that mean? It means a lot of things, but to get the most basic meaning, think about the role of images in the ancient world. A king who ruled over an empire would have images of himself placed in cities across the empire as a reminder of his authority and dominion. When you saw the image of the king, it reminded you of the king. If you were to defile the image of the king, that would be considered an attack on the king. In the Bible, God says that human beings were created in his image. So human beings are supposed to be some kind of reflection of God. Now, all of creation is a kind of reflection of God's nature and attributes, but only human beings are said to be created in God's image. So there's something special about the way human beings reflect or image God. There are two basic ways that human beings are the image of God. One is structural and the other is functional. This will be easier to understand with an example. Think of an airplane. An airplane has a function, flying. When an airplane is functioning properly, it flies. But an airplane can only function properly if it has a certain structure. It needs the necessary parts arranged in the right way. So an airplane has a structure and a function. Human beings also have a structure and a function. Our most important function is to image God. We're supposed to make the invisible God visible. And there are several ways that we can do this. God has authority and dominion over everything, but he gives human beings authority and dominion over the earth. We reflect God with our dominion over the earth. God is eternally a social being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have an eternal loving relationship. When God creates man in his image, he creates man as a social being. The Bible says male and female, he created them. We reflect God in the loving relationships we have with other people who are created in God's image. The most important relationship we can have is a loving relationship with our creator. Our love for God is a reflection of God's love for us. When our lives are properly oriented towards our creator, we become like a mirror that's positioned so that when people look at us, they see a reflection of God. So we image God in our relationship with God, in our relationship with other human beings, and in our relationship with the natural world. That's our proper function. But notice, we can only function in this way because we have a certain structure. Earlier, we briefly discussed the abilities and capacities that set us apart from other animals, our reasoning ability, our moral faculties, our aesthetic sense, and so on. 
these abilities and capacities image God because they're limited, finite, temporal versions of God's attributes. So, just as an airplane performs its proper function when it flies, we perform our proper function when we have the right relationship with God, with our neighbor, and with nature. And just as an airplane can only function properly because it has a certain structure, we can only function properly because we have a certain structure, namely the various abilities and capacities given to us by God so that we can be his image. Now, that makes us sound like some amazing creatures. We can see why some people are convinced that we're divine. Why are we simultaneously wretched, as Norm says? Well, when human beings fall into sin and rebellion, we take the abilities and capacities that God gave us so that we can be his image, and we use them to insult God and to degrade his image, other human beings and ourselves. That's what makes us so incredibly horrible. We take something that was given to us for a supreme good, and we use it for evil. It's like someone gives us money to open a homeless shelter, but we use it to start a human trafficking ring. That's why we're simultaneously divine and wretched. But are we doomed to stay this way? Are we stuck like this? Or did the God who created us in his image also make a way to restore the proper functioning of his image? Take it, Norm. And then there's this middleman, you see, uh, that's the savior, that through him we can, we can become divine, but we're born wretched. And so uh, it's a very fascinating idea. I kind of like that one, because it sort of makes sense. There you have it, the gospel according to Norm MacDonald. I like that one too, Norm. So, God creates us with certain abilities and capacities, a certain structure, so that we can image God properly, so that we can make the invisible God visible on earth. But we use those abilities and capacities for everything but imaging God properly. We use those abilities and capacities to try to keep God invisible on earth. But Christ, the perfect image of God, the one who truly made God visible on earth, restores our relationship with God. And by looking to Christ and imitating Christ, we grow in our ability to image God until we're no longer the image of God only in structure, but also in function. This has been affecting my view of the world since the day I became a Christian. To see how, just think about comedians as an example. Comedians can only do comedy because they have abilities given to them by God but they can use those abilities for anything they want. They can use those abilities for outright blasphemy. The stand-up of Sam Kinison is a good example here. Tons of mockery of Jesus and the Bible. But in using the abilities given to them by God, in using their intellect and wit and artistic sensibility, even in using their ability to speak, which is also given by God, they're still imaging God even if they're mocking God or degrading his image. When we use the abilities that make us like God in limited, finite, temporal ways, we image God. We may image God in a defective way, but we still image God. Absorb this idea and you start to see God everywhere. Not because everything is God, that would be pantheism, but because everything reflects God in some way. Nothing as much as man does, and no man as much as Christ does. You can watch speeches by Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, and all you'll be thinking is, you guys are glorifying God in ways you don't even realize. You can watch an episode of South Park or a Quentin Tarantino movie, and every time you see the work of a creative genius, you understand that the genius himself is the work of an even greater genius. You can go on Twitter and see the endless bickering as people try to demonstrate their worth to their group by attacking the right people, and all you see is God. All people image God. They just image him in defective ways. But once you understand the ways in which they're defective, you just see the image. Of course, it's much better when someone is imaging God properly, even if it's only for a few minutes of a podcast. 
and to hear clips of Norm MacDonald arguing for the existence of the soul or responding to the problem of evil, even though his arguments were pretty sloppy by the standards of a philosopher, to hear Norm fumbling his way towards the Almighty because of the inclination that God gave him to do that, it makes us think that Norm, at least at times, was the image of God in a better sense than most. I'd like to image God in some videos. How are you going to image God today?